Well, welcome to my talk. Thanks for coming to my talk. So my name is uh, Sebastian, and I want to talk about web programming in C++, which I think is, a, is, pretty, is pretty fun. Or at least it can, be, it can be more fun than it currently is. Before I go into the details on the tool TypeScript that I have built and what it does, I would like to show it to you and see how we could do web programming with better tools. So here, let me do some live programming. So here we have a little C++ program. And in the comments, you see very trivial JavaScript code. And I would like to program like the same JavaScript code, but in C++, and have this output a little message on the website. And so what we would like to have, and currently don't have, is something that, well, looks pretty much like the JavaScript code, because that's the API we're using. That's possibly what you're already familiar with, what is already documented. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. But in addition, like if this is C++, and I have to compile this anyway, then I would like to have some type checking along the way. And this is what I like to do. I want to have C++ program to a JavaScript API but I still want to have type checking. So, okay, let's add this little element to the document body, and then clickety-click, I'm uh, compiling this. And now, unfortunately, for demonstration, I get a compiler error. What does it say? It says, oh, there's no matching member function for font size. And why is that? Because a CSS style declaration font size takes a string and not a number. And now I remember, ah, in cascading style sheets, this font size needs a unit, which is why this is a string. So I was lucky I had a compiler here to catch that error, because that's really subtle. And if I fix that, then this compiles, of course. And what would the output look like? Well, unsurprisingly, it would look like this. This is what we just did. And I can even tell you and show you that this is really C++ compiled to WebAssembly and not JavaScript, because Google Chrome can tell us it is. So we can look at the source code, the C++ source code in Chrome, and when I reload, we can even set uh, breakpoints and debug this application. So that is including variable stack traces. We'll look at that later in more detail. So there's even tool support for this, which is pretty cool. So let me tell you what you have just seen. What you just saw was the TypeScript tool in action. And what this does is it can take type information for JavaScript library from TypeScript, because TypeScript has so-called TypeScript interface definitions for JavaScript libraries. And then I compile these type definitions from TypeScript into C++ header files that allow us now to do type-safe programming to a JavaScript API. So why do we build web applications in C++ in the first place? Maybe this needs a little bit of motivation. Usually, we at ThinkCell, we have an application, you may know or may not know, which is in C++. It's the desktop application. And recently, we wanted to build a small web application. It's very simple. This is an online tool, Tableau.com, and we want to import that chart and import it into a thing cell chart in PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. So the user can, in Chrome, select that chart, and then the web application opens. This is all of it. And he can map the data from Tableau to the categories, series, and values, let's say, of a stack chart. And then we switch to PowerPoint and insert that chart in PowerPoint, and that chart remains linked to the data you have on Tableau.com. So you've seen the web application was tiny. It's maybe 1,000 lines of code. And initially, we wrote it in TypeScript. But that meant we couldn't do any code sharing. And even for such a small application, because it had to interface with our native application, there was some amount of code sharing that we wanted to do. Sorry. And not only that, but even programming in JavaScript can be surprisingly hard. 
this application has one interesting bit in those thousand lines. This data that I'm getting is in like a database format. It's a lot of, um, let's say, key value pairs, and I have to sort them into the tabular format that I need to create a chart. So the individual data values can be numbers, they can be strings or dates, and I would like to sort them, then get the unique values, and then do a sequence of binary searches to transform this into this, which is what I need to create a chart. So I tried to do that in JavaScript or TypeScript, to be more precise, and that turned out to be surprisingly hard. So it starts when you try to sort an array in JavaScript, and the documentation tells you that by default, sorting an array in JavaScript means that all the elements will be converted into strings, and then their UTF-16 code unit values are compared. That's typically not what I do when I sort an array. And to make matters worse, the time and space complexity is not guaranteed. And then, to go on, there's no unique, make unique range algorithm or something. There's not even a binary search in the standard JavaScript library. So you have to do what every good JavaScript programmer does, and you go to NPM and you look for binary search, and then you can figure out which one is actually binary search and which of the 316 packages is actually a correct binary search. And having experience in C++, there would be an easier solution for me because C++ can do all of these things. We would have a data value that's a variant of double string and a time point. We could have a vector of those data values, fill it somehow, and then we have ranges sort, and still range is unique to get the range of unique elements. And last but not least, we can do binary search, and that has guaranteed logarithmic complexity. So in some cases, the C++ standard library is very, very powerful compared to some other languages. And even if it isn't, it's the language I'm more familiar with. It's possibly the language that I have a large custom library for that I would like to use. So there can be quite a number of good reasons to program uh, web applications in C++. Maybe only that you want to be bought for 20 billion by Adobe. That's one good reason, like Figma you might have heard was. I think a WebAssembly application. So what do I need to do to get C++ into the web browser, into the web? So first of all, I have to compile C++ for the web. Then I want to call JavaScript from C++. And then, in the end, I want to make these calls in some type-safe way using this tool that I've built. So in order to compile C++ for the web, we need WebAssembly and the associated tool chains, of course. And that's not a new technology. There have been a number of talks on WebAssembly. So this is going to be the shortest introduction to WebAssembly ever. WebAssembly is a binary format uh, that we can compile to, which is standardized and is supported by all major browser vendors, which is pretty huge for web technology. It is a fast and compact binary format that supports two low-level data types, which will be important. That's integer and floating point numbers. And each WebAssembly module runs in its own secure uh, sandbox in the browser. So WebAssembly is typically instantiated from JavaScript, a WebAssembly module, and can interact with that JavaScript environment. It can, for example, declare that it would like to import a function B from JavaScript, or that it would like to export one of its own functions to JavaScript. And it can even export access to its memory blob which is just a sequence of bytes that this WebAssembly module gets. In code, this would look a bit like this. We create some JavaScript functions. Our import table is a JavaScript object. Then we instantiate the WebAssembly object, passing the binary that we get some, from somewhere and the imports. And when that is instantiated, we can call the exported functions on it, for example. WebAssembly also has a standardized text format, which is handy if you want to look at the raw source code. So that's essentially the assembly format uh, for WebAssembly. And it reads pretty similarly. So here you can probably guess this is the beginning of the WebAssembly code for the C string compare function. So it takes two integers as arguments, which are pointers to zero terminated strings, and it returns an integer minus one zero or one, hopefully. 
And if I want to get a C++ application into the web browser, I don't only need, um, like I need a compiler, so that would be Clang, which has a WebAssembly backend for quite some time, and I need some runtime support. And all of this is packaged by mscripten. Um, so mscripten wraps the Clang compiler, and it comes with a large runtime library that lets us do useful things in the web browser from C++, making OpenGL calls, uh, getting input device events, making sound, things like that. So this has been extremely successful, especially when you want to port a self-contained application. So if input devices and uh, OpenGL and audio is all that you need, then you're probably a game, and this is what Mscripten works extremely well for. But I want to maybe interact with the JavaScript environment. Maybe I want to use an external JavaScript library for some other tool, for example, for Tableau.com. So this is not quite enough for me. Because what we can currently do with Mscripten when we want to call JavaScript from C++ isn't super beautiful. So there are three ways. There's one way we've seen initially that WebAssembly modules can import and export functions. So in C++, you would declare, declare it as extern C, and then uh, the WebAssembly instantiation would link it, as the mscript magic would link it against the JavaScript implementation, and you could call that function. But that would be limited to the data types that WebAssembly supports. So it can only take integers or floating point numbers as argument or return values. Um, there's another way in mscripten where you can directly embed JavaScript code inside your C++ code. Uh, so through some compiler magic, this JavaScript code would be extracted when you compile it and moved into some JavaScript module, and a function will be generated, and then you can call and call that. That is very handy, but it's also limited to integer and floating point arguments and return values. So again, you cannot pass strings or get JavaScript objects back and pass them around in C++, for example. And then there's the third way, which is the mscripten val API. I think it's the mbind API, which lets you transliterate JavaScript to C++ somehow. So here, for example, we can make a sound. But you see, the way we do this is we pass a lot of strings to the JavaScript world. And none of these calls are type checked in any meaningful way. So we create a global audio context object. We hope we don't make a typo here. Then we call a method on that thing. We explicitly have to specify the type of the return argument. The method name is passed by string. Again, there's no guarantee we've spelled oscillator correctly. And then the rest is the same. So it's very error prone. It is great that this works but it combines the disadvantages of both languages. So now we write this in C++, we have to compile it, that possibly takes uh, a long time, and this compilation step doesn't give us anything. It doesn't give us at least the type checking we are used to from C++. So we have now a compiled and untyped checked language, and that's, that's a pretty bad combination. That's not, that's not what we want, I guess. So how does that work behind the scenes? Behind the scenes, the mscripten mscript mscript runtime uh, has some methods to let us create JavaScript objects from C++ and to pass them around. And this is what we will need. These are, again, extra C functions that mscripten declares and implements in JavaScript. And what they do in the JavaScript world is pretty much what the title says. There's one function, for example, mValueObject, which will, implement it in JavaScript, create a new JavaScript object, an empty object, no properties, no nothing, and will create a reference count for that object, and will store both of these things in some map, again, in the JavaScript world, and it will ha return a handle to that object to the C++ world. So in the C++ WebAssembly world, we have an integer which references some object on the JavaScript side. We can play the same game by when we want to convert C strings to JavaScript strings. There's a function to do that. It gets a pointer, which is an integer. 
to the WebAssembly memory object. The JavaScript function can read this zero terminated string from the memory object character by character. It will append it to a JavaScript string and convert it possibly if the encoding is not correct and will store the string in a map again and return a handle to the C++ world. So in C++, those objects are all integers. And now you can probably imagine how increasing the reference count works. We can decrease the reference count. We can call methods on these things always by passing an integer handle. But we don't want to write it like this. We want to write something maybe like this. Like in my initial code example, where we have actual types that the compiler can check against, which have actual functions, and these functions take arguments that have a type, and we want to check against those types. So and this is what we, what we can do with, um, with my TypeScript tool. Any, any questions so far? how the subscription thingy works, then I'll just continue. So this is where my TypeScript tool comes in. It compiles TypeScript interface declarations to C++ interfaces, so we can make somewhat idiomatic calls to JavaScript libraries from C++ with a syntax that is at least similar to the JavaScript syntax, so where we would in JavaScript, maybe assign a string to the title property of a document, we can pass a string to the title function in C++. Um, and this tool is currently, I'm currently in the process of integrating this into the MScript and tool chain, so hopefully this becomes something that will be used more frequently, but that's still in progress. So what are these type definition libraries? How does that look? What's my source information? So this is an excerpt for the type definition library for the document object that we have seen. So you see that the document object has a URL property, which is a string, but it's read-only. It has active element on the page, which can be null. Uh, there's a list of things, and there is a title that I've manipulated, which is not read-only, which is why I can set it. And the cool thing about those TypeScript interface definitions, that's always a bit of a mouthful, is that they don't only exist for the standard JavaScript libraries, like the DOM API and stuff, but there's an online repository, which is officially part of TypeScript, where users can submit such type, type definitions for arbitrary JavaScript libraries. So this repository is huge already, and it has TypeScript declarations for a number of popular JavaScript libraries. So if you do some programming in JavaScript, chances are good that there is some type information available for this that we can use in C++. And TypeScript not only ships with those type definition libraries, but luckily for us, it also ships with a pretty powerful parser API. So we didn't even have to write that. That's a very short snippet of code that lets us read one of those interface definitions, and then we can iterate over all the syntax nodes in a file and check, is that a function declaration? Is that a variable statement? If it is a function declaration, what's its name? What's its return type, its arguments, etc. And the output looks a bit like this. So what we create is a type safe wrapper around the existing, not type-checked, mscripten API. So the output uses everything that mscripten already offers us, and we just have to create a type-safe wrapper here for the document title property, again, taking a string or returning a string. Yes. So now we do and this is why that's also a fun project to hack on, because we do something uh, that is quite interesting. We try to translate between two languages. We try to translate TypeScript constructs to C++ into meaningful C++. And we always have to ask ourselves, is that a language construct that we can translate at all, or is that too weird, too dynamic um, to be translated to C++? Oh, sorry, I misclicked. 
So this is, for example, valid TypeScript. So you have a function that takes uh, an argument A, and the type of that argument A is any type that has a length property. And I'm pretty sure we could write something that expresses this in C++, but it wouldn't probably be very, very easy. And luckily for us, our input is typically pretty benign, um, because there are also very lazy programmers who write these things, who might write something like that instead. And this is something we could easily translate to C++, because there's an actual type with an actual name that we can translate. That being said, there is uh, a large number of language constructs that we do support. All the base TypeScript constructs, any and undefined null string with optional members. Uh, there are type guards, which are a mix of a type check and a cast. There are union types. TypeScript supports mixed enumerations that we support as well. And you can pass C++ functions to JavaScript to be called as a callback, for example, in a button handler. And we also support TypeScript generic types, arrays, records, etc. And the tool is self-hosting, which means that it, for a while now, it compiles the TypeScript for the API it uses itself. And it also compiles all the standard libraries, including the DOM API. So you can use at least that and it compiles some other libraries, but not all of these super complicated big ones. So when that was the TypeScript code to um, create and parse a little TypeScript file, the equivalent C++ code looks very, very similar. And you can see here how we are passing a C++ Lambda to JavaScript and have that called back as a callback, in that case, for each, uh, for each syntax node that we encounter. But there are some interesting semantical differences between those two that, again, make this, a lot of the times, a fun project, because it's an open source project, so I have to plug this a bit as well. So in C++, we have the one definition rule, whereas in TypeScript, it is totally OK to define classes multiple times. And then those, these, these declarations with their properties will be merged, for example, into a single declaration. The type system is different, where we have a static type system in C++, where the names of classes matter in TypeScript with um, structural typing, where the name doesn't matter, but what matters is what properties a class has, has and if it has the correct set of properties. And then there are surprising differences like the overloading rules can be different. So here is something which probably wouldn't be valid, C++, where you have uh, an array with two constructors. And now when you create an array of a number with a single argument, it should be ambiguous which of those two things are called. But maybe not surprisingly, it is not ambiguous in TypeScript. Uh, I think it used the first one, but I don't know if that's a rule to use the first one or if that matched better for some reason. And then, of course, there are the uh, built-in types in TypeScript, unions, intersections, literal types that we have to transport to C++ somehow. And the priorities of the tool are to always generate valid C++ in the first place, of course. The output should compile. And it's better to leave something out and not translate it if we can't understand it that's better than generating invalid C++, obviously. And a few remarks about some design decisions that you might have noticed. So this is what the JavaScript looks like. We could probably implement something in C++ that would allow us to use this syntax as well. You would have some title member, and that would have some overloaded assignment operator, and then it suddenly would do magic and move that stuff to the JavaScript world. But I thought that's not a very good decision because it looks like this would be a very simple and very fast operation. It looks like this is just assigning to the member of a struct when, in fact, a lot of expensive interactions between C++ and the JavaScript world are going on. 
So, well, namespacing is one thing. I wanted to make it obvious when expensive operations happen and all this marshalling to JavaScript is expensive. So this should probably be a method in the first place. So at least we know that we are calling a method on some JavaScript object and passing data to that. And then there's also another expensive operation that I'm hiding here, which is the cast from a C++ string to a JavaScript string, where you have also seen that this round trips to JavaScript converts the C string to a JavaScript string, sends that back possibly, and then sends it back to JavaScript. So if you do that, at least you should know that this is an expensive operation. And then last but not least, now I've generated a conventional setter for this title property, which is probably what you would do if you wrote that code by hand. But implicitly, or well, explicitly, I've now changed the name of that member. So I knew the document has a title property, but I've changed it to set title. I cannot know if there's not another function in that object that already is called set title, and now I'm generating a conflict with that existing name. So we decided against changing the name, and somewhat unusually, the setter is called the same as the getter. It's just called title. But at least we know that that name is free, is still available. And then, among the, among the large number of differences that are actually pretty annoying in C++, is that in, in TypeScript, for example, the declaration order of classes doesn't matter. So this is valid TypeScript. We can define a union of foo and bar before declaring foo and bar. And, well, there's no reason why we couldn't change that in C++, but that's the way, that's the way it currently is in C++. In C++, we have to sort these and bring them in the correct order, which is what we have to do when we translate that to C++. There are union types in TypeScript, which are also very different from C++ unions. So a union of A or B or C doesn't have a discriminating value like a C++ union. You cannot figure out is this either A or B or C. It is instead all of those types at once. So a union A, B or C in TypeScript is defined as the type that has the members that the intersection, representing the intersection of the properties of those three types. So it's like a set theoretic thing. And consequently, because names don't matter in TypeScript, an object of that type can be constructed from any other type that has the correct set of properties. So how can we translate something like that to C++? That's what I said initially. That's what structural typing means in JavaScript and in TypeScript. A type is defined by its properties and not by its name. So that's different in C++. In C++, names do matter. Uh, but there are still a number of useful operations that we can do that are valid C++ and valid TypeScript. So we can say, for example, that such a union converts two common base classes of A, B, and C. That's certainly valid. They will all have this property. No, they will all have uh, an intersection of properties. Uh, we can convert to wider unions. That set will only get smaller if we add another type. And we can construct that from anything that A, B, or C can be constructed from, because they also will all have that type. And in practice, that works quite well, because as before, people will typically write something like that in practice, because they're very lazy and they won't repeat the same property three times to express that all these types are somewhat compatible. But they will write inheritance relationships that we can actually express in C++. And I said there are mixed enumerations in TypeScript. We can also translate these to C++ by exploiting another customization point that we have, which is the marshalling from the C++ world to the JavaScript world. And here we can say, well, we write a C++, a classic C++ enumeration, and we introduce some 
customization point for enumerations that tells us, well, we have a enumeration funny enum, and we create a map from the C++ enumeration to the value that this enumeration should have in JavaScript. And then we look that up and marshal that JavaScript value instead to the JavaScript world. So let me show you another short code example. Or not so short. So I've said before that we can pass C++ functions to JavaScript. So here we want to create uh, an event listener. We want to add an event listener to a button. Let me show you, the, let me show you the, the problem we are having, this very realistic problem. So we have this very untidy set of objects, and we want to sort them in C++. Now there's an add event listener method in JavaScript that takes a string as the first argument. Some, uh, there's a list of valid strings that we can pass. And then we can want to pass a function. And we cannot just pass a C++ function pointer to JavaScript, of course. They will not know what to do with it. But what we can do instead is, thanks to some code generation, we can pass an object, which is our click handler, which will receive a mouse event, which is when we are clicked, and then, again, reading more or less like the JavaScript equivalent, it can look up all the diff elements on the page, get them into an HTML collection, do it for each over them, because we made those collections of JavaScript objects compatible with, uh, with for eaches. Uh, we collect all of them in a vector, then we sort that vector by the client height of the diffs. This is... Uh, our thing cell range library, so we sort the vector in place using a less comparator comparing the client height. And then in the end, we iterate over those elements again and add them to the page. And now, of course, this works. And now I've already set the breakpoint. Let me prove first that it works. And again, we see the um, we see the we see the developer tools, and we see here. We can go into this in more detail, and we see the even the stack trace coming from the top level JavaScript code, um, and then down into the C++ code that we have just written. So how did, that, how did that work? And again, another case of why is that actually sometimes a good idea to program uh, in C++ instead of, in that case, in JavaScript. Programming application state in a reference-counted language like JavaScript can be surprisingly difficult. So let's say we want to add a button to some page. And then when that button is created, it registers itself as a click handler one of its member methods. And now this does something. And now you want to remove that button. And what happens is that you can do all you want. This button might live reference counted somewhere. This function callback keeps your object alive because it has captured it. Anybody might keep your object alive. And it's very, clear, very hard to program clear state transitions in your application. Uh, when, when that's your language model and that's all you have. And I always wonder when you encounter websites that suddenly get into a state where nothing works anymore, nothing, no click registers anymore, the buttons don't work anymore, I always wonder how often that is the case. Like that JavaScript code is in some funky state that nobody understood anymore and you have to reload the page and start from the beginning. In C++, we would do this in a more deterministic way. We would, could create the button. It can register its click handler, but we can remove it in the destructor as well, and that destructor will run at some deterministic place. And that can be a good idea. And what we can do then is we can also destroy our callback and are sure that this is never going to be called again. 
And then I think that's the last, the last um, detail I will, go, I will go into. What happens is that we create a helper object. Our little member function gets wrapped into a JavaScript object. The JavaScript object is a function object, of course. And this function object is the function that will be actually called from the website. And in that function, on the JavaScript side, we capture two things, our C++ function pointer and our C++ this pointer that we've passed into it. And when the JavaScript object is called, it will just call back into the C++ world, passing the function pointer and the this pointer back again to C++. And when our C++ object goes out of scope before that, then it can simply detach from its function object. And now when we're calling back into C++, then we first call a generic function, which will cast the function pointer. When that function pointer is cast, we have to unwrap the JavaScript arguments because we know the function signature. And then we end up in the function that we've actually implemented. And we support all the generic classes. We have seen that. So TypeScript has something uh, like C++ templates. We support this as well. These TypeScript generics can have constraints. They can, for example, say that some type should be an enumeration. And we can translate that into a C++ template that is templated on the enumeration value. And there are other kinds of constraints that would also be pretty obviously translatable into C++. For example, we could translate them as being requiring that some object is a base class of something else or is derived from some class. Um, but this has not been implemented yet. And again, because of the differences in typing, this is not quite the same. So in TypeScript, this would just require that T has the same properties as Node, whereas here we actually require an inheritance relationship. And then I've, you've seen those uh, indexed access types, which are a pretty special JavaScript thing. And I think I will skip, skip over those. Uh, we could implement them using some boost HANA magic. But the important thing is that um, we can cover the important cases, types, uh, generics, and function calls. And the TypeScripting tool would be superseded by, the, by some, something that is called the WebAssembly interface type proposal, which is still in a very early phase, which would allow WebAssembly to directly interface with JavaScript objects when they have some defined interface. But here, as in the C++ standardization, it's probably a good idea to have something to experiment with uh, before that becomes standardized. Um, there are currently from this very simple implementation that has some performance implications, unfortunately, because these calls have to round trip a lot of strings to JavaScript. So all these names, function names, have to be converted to JavaScript. Uh, strings are then looked up on the JavaScript side. Does that object exist? Does that member function exist? So this is a bit slow a bit slow, as in relatively very slow. Um, but there are some ideas how to, how to improve that performance. And I don't think when you're making JavaScript calls to DOM API, that might not be the first thing you have to worry about. But still, that's also in progress. OK, so there are still some open challenges. There are things called literal types, for example, where you can make types up out of permitted strings. Uh, Mscript and integration is probably the big one um, that has to come uh, first. And with that, I think I'm done. I would uh, love you to check out this tool and, and tell me and write to me what you think about it. And that concludes my talk. And I thank you very much for your attention. Yes. 
Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the work. Uh, I, I, like this is a little bit silly question, but really, if you had a thousand lines JavaScript application, developing a tool that converts TypeScript to C++, <laughs> it, seems seems like, it seems like a lot of work for a thousand. It seems like that's true, and we wouldn't have done that if there hadn't been a master student who wanted to do a master thesis uh, at our company, and that's the project we had for him. Ah, that's really cool. That's, okay. how it, that's how that came to life, yes. I have just taken over that tool. Um, do you have any, any escape hatch currently, like for instance with the um, tag types and having uh, some of them, and I just want to treat it as a string. Can I do that without modifying the TypeScript file? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Yeah, um, you want so to have an escape hatch yeah, like when you want to do something that mm. the interface doesn't support. Yeah, like just treat it as a string and uh, basically without modifying the existing TypeScript file so that the TypeScript developers don't get angry at me. Without modifying, I thought you, d you don't mean calling JavaScript untyped check. No, like, like I have in TypeScript an unsupported construct like um, literal types or some of uh, them. We, I try to convert them to any. Okay. Like, so in TypeScript, there's always this fallback type yeah. any. And so the idea, that's also the idea for the mscripten integration, when I proposed that to, to Elon Sakai on the mailing list, he said, okay, it would be cool to remove the existing API and like have this also as the untypes checked fallback so that we could make any calls on an any type, for example. Right. I haven't done that, but currently we use the raw mscripten API as that SK patch. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, so, just so okay, like you mentioned there's a lot of overhead, probably because uh, like you have to jump between WebAssembly and JavaScript, uh, right? I know that wasn't uh, like the title of your talk, but maybe you can talk a little bit about how that works, like how the JavaScript interacts with WebAssembly. Um, sure, I think so. First, this overhead is exclusively those strings I'm passing here. So in a, way, um, in a way, that's the worst possible way to do it. What would be way more elegant and, and faster would be to take the, the JavaScript that I know I want to write here, which is mylib.next, and embed this in here as an in, in, how's it called? inline JavaScript. And then it would be optimized on the JavaScript side because it's not dynamic code anymore. It's like a hard-coded statement and the JavaScript optimizer knows what it has to do. And then I would just have to do all this argument conversion myself. So I would have to make sure that the objects I'm passing in here are converted to integers and unwrapped on the JavaScript side and the return values vice versa. So I have to... I have to take this API apart a bit and hard code the JavaScript part and do the wrapping, unwrapping of arguments myself. And then this performance penalty, I think, would go away, largely. Performance penalty compared to just calling the function in JavaScript. Like, if you... So yes, if, because, yes. Without any WebAssembly, so you're saying, saying that WebAssembly, I remember it was a problem, but if you're saying that WebAssembly has no longer any overhead when calling JavaScript, that's No, cool. I, think, uh, I think there was some link on the website. So the, the, the declaring an extern C function in WebAssembly, implementing it in JavaScript and calling it that way, that is super fast. And that's, I think there, was, there were a lot of articles on the Firefox developer blog how they made this as fast as possible. There were problems with which sandbox does that live in and stuff. But they optimized that um, because it's, that's the simplest case. And I think I would, make, I would like to make the calls like that to hard code a JavaScript, but then I have to convert the argument to myself. Yeah, oh, sorry, he has the microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is regarding the de debugging. Uh, recently, I was trying to debug my own WebAssembly code uh, and 
Uh, it was really painful. Uh, I can follow my breakpoints, uh, see how it is working, but uh, to see the values of the variables is uh, really doesn't much helpful. Maybe do you have some suggestions or hints how we, we can uh, have an easy debugging on this? But did you see, did you get that far? Did you also see that? Because that's as good as it gets. So you have the actual code and the actual variables. Or did you see the raw WebAssembly? Uh, I can see this. Uh, I can see that debugger stops on the breakpoint, but the values of the elements, for example, uh, they are also, I think there are, now I, I don't have anything interesting here, it's just uh, a JavaScript object. Um, I think this needs one of the latest Google Chrome builds. I think then there's an additional add-on that you, that you need, which is here, the dwarf. There is some visual code extension as well to have the same debugger on the Visual Studio code. I don't I know. No, maybe not. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but so this is compiled. This is compiled to Wasm with debug information. And if you have the Google Chrome DevTools add-in, then Google Chrome at least supports everything that a basic C++ IDE needs. It's not integrated with Visual Studio Code or anything. It's just in Chrome but you can debug and you can see variables and stack traces. Okay. So this is, uh, I think, currently as good as it gets. I will try once more because I can see the call, call stack, uh, but uh, I cannot see the values of the variables. I think maybe variables. you just need to, one of the Chrome builds, or I'm using the Chrome dev build. Could be that you need the Chrome dev, the developer branch of Chrome. I will double check, thank you. Uh, very cool library. Um, I'm actually a JavaScript developer, so it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever tried going the other way, wrapping a, a C++ module and making a TypeScript interface to that? No. No, I, no, I have not. And I know there have been feature requests, well, there have been requests on the mscript mailing list to go the other way and make that easier and ask me if I'm supporting that as well. But we were only interested in the other way. And maybe precisely also regarding the other question, why we did that for a 1,000 line web application. We, we didn't do it for that web application, but we, so our, our product is an add-in for Microsoft Office, and we wanted to explore web programming in case people move to Office on the web. How can we extend that? How can we program for that? How, we can, how can we port our existing C++ code base potentially into something that has to run in the browser? So all that motivated that decision. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Not really a question, just a short remark to his question about performance. So calling between JavaScript and MScript is normally fast. The issue is when you touch the DOM. If you touch the DOM from Wasm, that's still, at least in my knowledge, is that it's really slow. The what? If you have to touch the document object model from WebAssembly. Okay. No, well. Yeah, because then at least you have to, you certainly have to wrap mm. right. and unwrap the JavaScript objects. Yeah. So how, do you have like a front end library that you're using to display everything as well? Like in, in JavaScript, you mean to, to, to follow JavaScript UI? Yeah, like, because you're doing something way more complicated than these examples for displaying a UI. Um, yes, but even even so, I think this this little um, this little web application that I've shown initially, it it, it doesn't it hasn't it, that's I mean, yeah, yeah. it has a few combo boxes and a table. We actually coded that by hand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you wouldn't wrap something like React or Angular? No. And <laughs> no. No. It, it was again. That was one of the first tries. We had somebody, he knew React, he built something, and it was pretty hard to understand. Like for a company that doesn't do that very often, you needed something that was very easy to understand. And then doing React for this instead of like explicitly programming your 
the, the uh, lifetime of those things turned out to be way more, way harder to understand. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for the talk. Thank you very much for your questions.